Rise and Wamped, episode 229 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode I chat with Allegra Custins. Allegra is an associate marriage and family therapist specializing in the treatment of OCD. And I got her on to talk about her own OCD story and she goes into detail around her experience of paedophile themed OCD and what that was like for her. Uh, And then we go into talking about becoming an OCD therapist and her journey there. And uh, she wrote an article called Five Roadblocks to Acceptance in the Treatment of OCD, which I thought was a really good article. So I took the time to go into more depth into those five points with her. And we talk about much more such as shame, her own OCD advocacy, words of hope, how the OCD Game Changers event inspired her to open up about her own story and uh, acceptance of the disorder, that being OCD. So thanks to Lego for her time and to you guys for listening. OCD sponsor the OCD Stories podcast. OCD are passionate about making treatment more accessible, connected and affordable. They now take insurance from some US insurance companies. OCD's therapy services are only available in the US currently, but the free tools in their mobile app are accessible to all. To find out more, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the description. Now on to the episode with Allegra Castens. On the podcast today is Allegra Custance. Allegra is an associate marriage and family therapist specializes in the treatment of OCD and anxiety disorders. Allegra is also an OCD advocate and a blogger on psychology today. Welcome to the podcast, Allegra. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. It's good to have you on. Um, and yeah, you've been on my radar for a while, so it's nice to, <laughs> to, to speak to you. Um, so yeah, so let's start with kind of um, before we get into your therapy story, just your OCD story, and you can go into as little as much detail as you want. Okay. So I guess I should start with in eighth grade, I had obsessions that I didn't know at the time were obsessions. Mm-hmm. But then when I had my OCD kind of full blown manifest at age 19, it made a lot more sense to me. So in eighth grade, I started getting um, like intrusive images of my math teacher naked and it like wasn't an attractive math teacher. It was obviously something that was really not appealing to me, but in eighth grade, I had no idea what it was. Like it made me feel really uncomfortable internally, but it kind of passed after a couple of weeks. So I never really thought anything of it. And then when I was 19 years old, I remember I was working at like a clothing store boutique and I had this one thought pop into my mind. It was like, what if you had sex with that child that just walked in? And it was like game over for me. My whole entire world shifted. I felt like my brain shifted. I know that sounds kind of weird, but it felt like I was living in a different brain. It was absolutely terrifying. It was accompanied by like this really horrible feeling in my stomach And from that point on, I started getting intrusive thoughts, like literally all day, every day. Mm. And it was terrifying because I had always loved kids. I had worked at a daycare when I was, how old was I? When I was in like, I think my freshman year of college, I worked at a daycare with little kids. Ever since I can remember, kids had been like my absolute favorite. I said I was born to be a mom. So having these thoughts and images absolutely terrified me. And I mean, at that time, I had no idea that it was OCD and I didn't even really know what OCD was. And I also was too afraid to Google and figure out like why I was having these thoughts. You know, I don't think people want to Google like, why am I having sexual thoughts of kids pop into my mind? Because it's terrifying. You know, I thought I was a pedophile, even though I knew that, like I knew logically that I wasn't, but the thoughts and feelings felt so real that I, I just like, I guess, I don't know what I, I, I was lost. Let's just say that. So for, I think it was about a year. I had thoughts and feelings, intrusive images all day long. I remember they like targeted one particular child in particular, which sounds super weird, but I know that happens for a lot of people with OCD Mm. and I just could not get the thoughts out of my mind, which obviously the more you try, like the more they're going to stick around. So I like I literally at one point, I think a couple months into it, I thought I was schizophrenic because the thoughts and the like images feel so real, even though you know that you're seeing the image in your mind or you know that you're hearing the thought in your mind. Mm -hmm. To me, it felt like this is not me, like this is not who I am. 
And when they kind of like, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when they pop into your mind consistently, like it kind of feels like you're hearing something, even though you're not. So I thought I had schizophrenia. I remember one night I like had a dream about my OCD. It like popped up in my dream and I woke up that next morning. Like I was so disgusted. I looked in the mirror and I thought, okay, I'm going to tell my parents I'm schizophrenic. Like I'm going to do this. Like I can get help. And then I just never did because I was so afraid. Like I was so afraid of what the thoughts might mean. I was so afraid that I could be schizophrenic So I didn't tell them and I kind of just continued living my life um, as difficult as it was. Like I continued working and I had started working at a PR firm in Los Angeles and it got to the point where people could notice that I was suffering, although it was all in my mind, like the obsessions and compulsions were mental. Like I would cry at work, I would cry in my car, I would cry in the bathroom and I think God, what point was that? I think like a year later, I had Googled like, why am I having these thoughts? I remember the day in particular. It was a day, I think it was in August. And I like was so sick of these thoughts. I thought to myself, like, I'm either going to have to go to a residential treatment center or I'm not going to be able to live like this, Mm -hmm. which I know sounds super dark, but I was like, I just knew like this would not be the life that I'm going to live, you know, forever. So I Googled it and I found some things about OCD, I think on intrusivethoughts.org, which I love their website. Hmm. I think it's made of millions now. But I like, so I found some stuff about OCD, but I still didn't believe it was OCD at the time because of everything that we hear in the media and how often it's misrepresented. So at least I thought to myself, okay, well, this is a possibility, but I'm still not doing anything about it. I'm not going to speak to somebody Because who wants to speak to a therapist about having sexually intrusive thoughts about kids? Like, I think that is probably the last thing anybody would ever want to tell someone. Mm. So I kept it to myself. I kept working. And then I think there was one day at work in particular where I was like crying on the phone outside. And my colleague just came up to me and was like, this is enough. Like, I've seen you suffer for too long. You need to see someone. So she picked up her phone and she called her therapist who found me a therapist and I started seeing her. That was, I think, like a year and a half or so into having OCD, which I'm lucky. I feel like a lot of people go like 10 to 12 years without knowing, but that year and a half of like 24 seven thoughts, that was enough. That was like, that was literally the worst thing to ever happen. So I saw that therapist and she, I still see her now. She's my absolute favorite, but she's not an OCD specialist. So I was seeing her and she tried her best and she told me like, I'm not an OCD specialist. So she was very upfront about it. And it took me so long to tell her my thoughts. Like I was so afraid of them. I thought that like, if I said them out loud, it would give them power. I thought she was going to judge me so harshly. So like every single session with her, I would just sit and cry. And then maybe in like the last five minutes, it would be like a, I think it's called like a doorknob disclosure or something where you like say it at the last five minutes Mm -hmm. of the session. So I would do that with her. And um, what else happened after that? Am I, is this too long or should I continue? No, keep going. (laughs) So yeah, Lori changed my whole life. And she's actually the reason that I wanted to go into therapy, not the OCD itself, but then like it happened. So She had me see someone who was like in her building who specialized in OCD and I was really hesitant to see him and I ended up doing that and he was nice enough, but he was like, at one point he compared him going bald to like me having thoughts about pedophilia and I was like beside myself because to me it's like, of course going bald is a huge fear for many people, but at least like you know that you have your identity as a human being and you're not having sexual thoughts about children. So I just didn't think that he really understood it. It wasn't a good fit. So I stopped seeing him. And then Lori kept trying to get me to go to an OCD specialist. And I don't know why I was just so against it. I don't know if I wasn't ready or if I was terrified, but then one day I think she like did some Googling for me and she found the OCD center. This was probably two years, three years, I'm not sure, into me suffering. So she found the OCD center. She said, give them a call. And I looked at their website. I found somebody who I wanted to see, and I was really particular about it. Like I wanted a younger female 
because I just thought like how weird to be telling these like sexually intrusive thoughts to like a 65, 70 year old man. Not that that like matters, you know, of course they could understand it, but I felt like I was a disgusting human being. Like I did not want to do that. So I remember the therapist I wanted to see had a wait list and the client coordinator at the OCD center kept saying like, look, we have this other therapist available. Why don't you see her? And I said, absolutely not. So I waited for that therapist to be available and I started seeing her and that's when my OCD journey shifted completely. It took a while for sure in treatment and it took a while to grasp the concepts of acceptance and exposure and response prevention. But seeing that therapist, um, her name is Shiva actually like changed my entire life. Mm. So at that point I got the tools and I I got on medication, which was another really big part of my journey. I was super against that too, but now Prozac is, um, it's everything to me. So (laughs) Prozac and therapy changed my life. Yeah. So I started seeing Shiva and, um, like I said, everything changed for me from there and eventually over time, like it's not overnight, but I think little by little, the therapy successes add up. And I looked back on like, two years of OCD treatment. And I want to say I was like 95% better, which I know sounds odd because there's not recovery. And of course I still get intrusive thoughts, but like practicing acceptance, leaning into the thoughts and anxiety, like completely changed my whole mindset. Mm. So with the right therapy, I, I feel like a completely different person. Like I used to describe my life as like having two parts, like before the OCD and after the OCD, which I still kind of do because I feel like the OCD did change everything. But I think I feel more myself now than I ever have in my entire life, which is really weird because I obviously still have OCD. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of my story. My, uh, my obsessions never really shifted. Um, I remember one day, I think I was trying to have the harm obsessions because I didn't want the pedophile obsessions, which I know also sounds insane, but I was like trying to force my brain to think of something else and it just wouldn't like, it wouldn't stick on the harm obsessions, which really bothered me. Yeah. Yeah, POCD was my main theme. Um, I still get like random, like relationship obsessions now, but pedophilia was like, I think the main thing that bothered me and really the only thing that comes up now along with like other sexual obsessions, like incest, animals, Mm -hmm. and that stuff. Yeah. No, well, thank you for going into your story. I know it's not always easy, so I appreciate you being open. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to get into the PACD a bit. Uh, Mm -hmm. But before I do that, one question around, you said uh, you feel more yourself now than you you ever did, which is Mm -hmm. a great statement. Uh, And I'm just curious just to unpack that a bit more of of why you think that is. Yeah, I think like this, there are a couple of different reasons and some don't even relate to the OCD, but right before the OCD like really manifested, I was actually struggling with anorexia and I used to blame the anorexia and myself for the reason my OCD was so bad because I know if, or the reason I guess it manifested, like obviously I had symptoms before. So I kind of used to blame myself and I thought if I would have just eaten, then like none of this would have ever happened. So my life before the OCD was, it just wasn't, it just wasn't me. Like I played soccer, which I look back now and I'm like, how did that happen? I played for like 14 years. It was really a odd time in my life. So I just never really felt like myself. And then the OCD happened and I thought like, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have kids. Like this has destroyed me. So at that point, I kind of just accepted like my life is shit and it's never going to get any better, um, even though I really wanted it to. And then I think as I started to get better and as I realized I wanted to be a therapist, I kind of just came into my own. And I think as much as like struggling with OCD, like almost killed me, I also think it like it changed the course of my life in a good way as well. And I feel like I'm better able to tolerate uncertainty and anxiety. And of course, I don't have certainty about who I am. Nobody does. But I feel like I am more certain of myself, ironically, than I like even was before the OCD mm-hmm. came about. So I feel like I have more certainty. I feel like I have a purpose and like a mission in life, which is OCD advocacy and treatment. And I feel like like I said, as shitty as this disorder is, it really gave me like so much of who I am today. 
no thank you thank you for sharing um yeah that's that's great uh so uh the pacd um obviously a tough topic to discuss sometimes so i appreciate you kind of being so open about how it affected you and came into to your life um Mm -hmm. i have done an episode on it before um so people definitely check that out if that's your your theme but it'd be great to unpack your side of things so um at what point did you because you're you're open about it now and on your instagram and stuff at what point i guess in your journey were you able to start kind of yeah just speaking about the theme specifically that's a good question it took i want to say four years Mm -hmm. Um, Even when I was in grad school, I was still kind of uncomfortable. And I think mostly because like people, not that I was as ashamed eventually like to have OCD because I understand OCD for what it is, but I think a lot of people don't. So I was concerned about like, if I speak openly about this, no one's going to want to marry me. No one's going to want to have kids with me because they're going to presume that I'm this horrible person. And then it was actually, I went to Chrissy's Game Changers event, not this year, but the one before that. And that's kind of when I decided, like, I am finally ready to share my story because I saw how, like, badly people were suffering at that event. And I spoke to a lot of moms just, like, sobbing about how bad their kids were struggling, one of which I think was in seventh grade and was experiencing, like, a ton of sexual obsessions So at that point, I thought, okay, I wasn't 100 percent ready because I don't think anyone ever is to really like, you know, come out with their OCD story. But at that point, I think I had enough courage and enough more not even courage, because I think that's the wrong word, because I don't think anyone ever needs to share their story like it's courageous enough to live it. Mm -hmm. But I think I had um, I don't know the word that I'm looking for. I think I was inspired because I didn't want people to be struggling for so long with something that they had like absolutely no idea about. So it was probably four years in, I started talking openly about it. And I wrote an article for intrusivethoughts.org and was like pretty explicit about the things that went on in my mind. And that was the point where I also made the decision, like if a guy or a girl or whoever I marry sees this, then like, they're going to love me for me. And if they don't, then they're the wrong person for me. Mm. So I think I've come to that point where like the people I love in my life will love me for like having the OCD or not. And I don't really care what other people think, but it took a while. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of a, kind of a a self-acceptance almost of this is who I am. I like who I am. And if people can't handle that, yeah, absolutely. And I think an acceptance of the disorder too, because I fought it for so long. I remember every single session with my therapist, Lori, and then my OCD therapist, I would say, I don't want this. I'm not accepting these thoughts. This is horrible. And like, you need to make this go away. And that just continued, obviously, my suffering. But I think I didn't accept having the disorder for a long time. And then I didn't accept that I could be like a worthy human being while having the disorder. And that took like four years of therapy, I think, to get to that point um, to like feel like I'm not just a disgusting human being. Because I think especially with the sexual obsessions, like POCD especially, I think there's that added layer of shame. Not that other people with OCD don't experience shame. Of course, everyone does. But I think pedophilia is like the like it's being a pedophile is the last thing that anybody would ever want to be. And especially in society. I think it's so difficult to be able to go to someone and say, I'm experiencing these sexual thoughts about children because it's alarming for a lot of people. And let's say like contamination concerns, so horrific. But if you went to someone and said, I'm really afraid that I'm going to get HIV by touching this doorknob, like it wouldn't be as alarming, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, work around shame. Yeah. Yeah, No, thank you for clarifying that. I think, yeah, there is a lot of shame work that, that needs to be done. Um, and I also often think that OCD is OCD, right? And the themes are kind of just different masks, but mm-hmm. each theme does have its own nuances and has its own, its own battles, you know, yeah. POCD is like more shameful. There's more shame to mm-hmm. deal with. Um, I try to think relationship OCD, you've obviously got another human being involved, which yeah. is a different complexity that other themes won't have. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. that that's, um, uh, yeah, I appreciate you talking about PACD. And I guess before we move on from that, is there anything else on that theme specifically that you think doesn't get talked about or people need to know more of, et cetera? 
Wow, that's a really good question. I mean, not that I think the theme doesn't get talked about enough, but I definitely think there could be more, mm. uh, like, I guess, candid conversations surrounding it. I guess the, like, things that I would bring up relating to my story that might make people feel a little bit less odd is I used to literally have, like, naked images of, like, babies pop into my mind, and I used to get, like, the grono response, which was literally the worst thing ever. And, um, like just having like sexual thoughts in your mind, your body might like respond to that because that's just what the body does. So if you're experiencing these thoughts and you feel like a groinal response, that doesn't mean that you are aroused by the thoughts. It likely just means that your body has responded to sexual content, which it does. So I would say like feeling the groinal response, um, especially regarding pedophile obsessions is really difficult because the thoughts are obviously ego dystonic and that, like they are so opposite to who you are. But then when you feel the like grown-up response, it makes you think, oh my God, I'm attracted to this or this is real. So mm -hmm. feelings in that way, whether emotionally or physical, are not facts. And another thing I like to point out is like a lot of my OCD came in the form of like phrases, which I know sounds so weird, but I had phrases that would replay in my mind like 24 seven as well like really just horrible stuff. Like one of them was like sexually molest. Um, another, I can't even remember because I had so many, but that was horrifying to me too. And I often get asked by people like, my thoughts don't come in a what if I'm a pedophile, they come in phrases or they come in just like words. And that's also OCD. Yeah. So whatever it is that you're experiencing doesn't make it any less um, of OCD than something else. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you for, for clarifying that. So it's almost like statements again versus yeah. questions. Yeah, or like I know some like of my clients will get like rape him, like and it just like replays over and over and it's the last thing you'd want to do, but it's an obsession that pops into your mind. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. I don't think that's ever been said on the podcast, so <laughs> that's great. Um, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, before we move on to the next bit, is there anything on your therapy story that you didn't share that you wanted to? Um, yes. So when I decided I wanted to go back to school for therapy, I was working in PR at the time. And my therapist, Lori, is literally the best human being ever. And I'm not just saying that. Like, she truly is. I hope she listens to this. Um, and she changed my life in every which way. I like a lot of attachment based work. So it's like nothing really related to the OCD in particular. Although I was really surprised that she's not an OCD specialist. And she was the one that diagnosed me like first session. She's like, wow, it sounds like you have OCD, which is I'm just so lucky. But she was the one that inspired me to be a therapist. And when I decided to go back to school, I was not going to work with OCD. I thought, like, I have these thoughts all day long. There is no way in hell that I'm going to sit with people and pick up all of their obsessions. Because that's a real fear for people with OCD. Like, if someone tells me their obsession, it's going to cling to me. And that did happen to me sometimes when, um, like, when I was in the throes of it. I remember, I have it on my bookshelf. Oh, there's a book called The Man Who Couldn't Stop. I don't know if you've read it. David Adam? Let's see. Yes. Cool. Yes. So um, I like I started reading his book and then he had this compulsion where he would like count to like 11 or something. And I remember I was like I was dead for like a week. I couldn't stop in my mind, like obsessing about whether or not I was going to have that compulsion. So my mind was really sticky. It would stick mm -hmm. on to anything. And so I didn't want to work with OCD. I thought, hell no, like this is enough OCD. Maybe I'll work in eating disorders because I have like passion for that as well. And then. At some point in my journey, I just kind of realized that I wanted to give back in the same way that like my therapist had given to me. And I decided to work as a behavioral coach at UCLA um, at their intensive outpatient program. And I was never 100% ready to work with OCD. And I get asked that a lot. Like, how do you know when you're ready? How do you know that your client's obsessions are not going to scare you? And my answer is like, you're never going to be 100% ready. But I think you have to be ready to a point where you can like treat the client and you can be fully present for the client. It doesn't mean you're not going to get intrusive thoughts about them. It doesn't mean that your OCD is not going to be like loud at certain points. But I think you have to be ready to do whatever it is that your clients do. So while I wasn't 100% ready, I was pretty ready. 
And I did still kind of have that fear going into like my first OCD position that I would pick up other people's obsessions. But as I like went through the program and was working with clients, I realized like nothing was going to stick like the POCD did for me. Like that was just the worst thing ever. And any other obsession, honestly, like would have been not welcomed, but it probably would have been like a lot easier to deal with than the pedophile obsessions. So I don't think, I think a lot of people think if I have OCD, I can't be a specialist, but that is absolutely not true. So that's an important point. And then another one, which I don't feel like a lot of therapists talk about, but this happens to me. Like sometimes in session, I'll get like a thought about my client or um, I'll be worried that I'm going to have thoughts about my clients. And that definitely comes up sometimes in the room for me. I practice mindfulness or I lean into it. I'm like, yep, I want to kill them or totally want to fuck them right now. Mm -hmm. And then I move on with the session. So that's another thing. Like, of course, like we're not going to be a hundred percent present with clients all the time, but it's also okay to like have obsessions that pop up in the sessions with clients. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'm really trying to say with all of that is you don't need to be cured and you don't need to be at a perfect place in your recovery to help others. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's important to share. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need to be, you just need to be ready enough. Ready know, enough. Wh whatever that's exactly that is. It. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, every therapist has their own stuff they're bringing into the room. They try not to, but you can't completely be sort of a You're blank so slate. Right. Or, yeah. And I think that's why so many therapists get into therapy. And I like, I don't usually have like bad OCD spikes, but I think it was like a month and a half ago, I had like a decently bad one. And I said to my therapist, Lori, like, I am so embarrassed that I can't get this shit together when I treat clients. It was like a day of struggling, but still it felt like a lot to me. And she said to me, Allegra, being a therapist doesn't like, it doesn't rid you of anything at all. It doesn't rid you of your own struggle. It just means that you are helping others and you likely better understand if you've dealt with something yourself. So that kind of speaks to what you were saying that like every therapist has their own thing and every therapist has anxious thoughts that pop up during session and the work is to bring yourself back. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And there's there's a quote on your website uh, by Irvin Yollum. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember exactly, but it's something along those lines, I think, about mm -hmm. Yeah. everyone is affected by something in life well they can't escape the, yeah, yeah it's really universal like pain and suffering are universal and even mental illness whether or not you have like a full-blown manifestation of a diagnosis at some point you've probably dealt with anxiety or depression so that's very universal absolutely or grief or mm -hmm. yeah no thank you for sharing um absolutely. So, so I wanted to unpack an article you wrote on your Psychology Today blog, um, and all the, I'll put all links to this stuff in the show notes. Um, but the article was titled The Five Roadblocks to Acceptance in the Treatment of OCD. Mm -hmm. um, and I like these uh, five misconceptions, as you've called them. So I thought I'll ask the, each one, and then if you could just kind of unpack it. Um, so the first one is acceptance means that I am accepting the thoughts as truths. And I have, this is my additional bit to your question or statement is I've definitely heard this loads of times within the community around if I accept the thoughts, then that means they I'm saying they're true you know, mm -hmm. or I agree with them or I want them to be true. Yeah, that's such a common misconception. So I think when people use the word acceptance, if if the sufferer doesn't understand what we mean by acceptance, then they're going to fight it, which was me and my own treatment for a long time. And as you work through mindfulness, which is acceptance in a nutshell, you learn that accepting a thought is not accepting that it's true. Accepting thoughts means that you're accepting their presence. So you're letting the thoughts be there without fighting with them. Because we know that when we fight thoughts, they stick around. When we try to suppress them, they come back more. Like thought suppression doesn't work. So acceptance does not mean, okay, I'm having a thought that I'm a pedophile. I accept that I'm a pedophile. It's I accept that I'm having this thought that I'm a pedophile. I'm going to let that thought be here and I'm not going to engage with it. Because when we can practice acceptance and stop fighting our thoughts, our thoughts stop fighting us. So it doesn't mean that you are accepting that it's true 
And letting it be there also doesn't mean that it's true. We have a million thoughts a day that aren't true that pop into our mind that we don't care about. Like I could say right now that the sky is green. And just because I have that thought and I let it be there, it doesn't mean that the sky is all of a sudden green. It just means that's a thought that I've had. Yeah, really good point. And uh, as you said that, you know, I, I had an image pop into my head of the sky being green. Mm -hmm. you know? And just because yeah. you, you said it, I thought it doesn't make it true. Absolutely. Mm. We have so many thoughts that like we just let be there. And I, I also use this in terms of like thought action fusion or magical thinking. Like a lot of clients say, OK, well, if I accept this thought and let it be there or if I accept the presence of the thought, it's going to come true. And that is magical thinking. And an example I'll often use is like, look at that lamp in session right there and make it move with your mind. And we sit there for one to two minutes and they can't do it. So they see like our thoughts are not that powerful. Having a thought does not mean that it's going to come true. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's the acceptance of the existence of the exactly. thought versus the content of the thought yeah we're accepting mm -hmm. the presence of the thoughts we're not accepting that the content is true because accepting that the content is true that is essentially certainty and we don't get certainty absolutely um no thank you so misconception two is it is irresponsible to accept the presence of anxiety without reacting to it this is a big one that comes up in my work with clients and with OCD clients get a lot or sufferers get a lot of false alarm feelings. Mm -hmm. So the brain um, is actually wired differently. Like somebody with OCD has a brain that's wired differently than someone without. And the fear center is really hyperactive. So it's setting off false alarms all day long that feel like you are really in danger, but in reality, it's a false alarm. So of course, when we're feeling like we're in danger, we want to respond to that because that's what we do as human beings. Anxiety serves a purpose for us and it really has like evolutionary value to us because like when we pay attention to anxiety that's real, it keeps us alive. Like I often say to clients, what would you do if you were standing in the middle of a crosswalk and a car was speeding at you? And they say, I would feel something in my body and I would run out of the way. And anxiety is beneficial to us in that way. But with OCD, anxiety is not beneficial to us because of the false alarms that we're getting. So it would be irresponsible to ignore anxiety if we were actually in real danger. But with OCD, we're not. The brain thinks that we are in danger. So the work is to tolerate that feeling of being in danger and not do anything about it, which does feel really irresponsible. Hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And um, I always think of sort of evolution and um, the, the idea of, well, today's society uh, is, is considerably safer than it was 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. Um, so, you know, our fight or flight system is kind of, uh, a creation from back then it, it's designed for those times where there was I hate to say it saber-toothed tigers walking around or there was you know other villages trying to kill you and take your resources and x y and z you know I'm sure it wasn't that bad but uh you know but now it's a lot safer and most times in the day when our anxiety or fight or flight goes off we're not actually at risk um so it's almost yeah, it's just, I don't know why I bring that up, but just that the wiring is for a different yeah. time. Exactly, 100%. And especially when our brain is wired differently than someone without OCD, like someone without OCD is not getting all of those false alarms. Yeah. So maybe for them, they are better able to trust their feelings, but us with OCD, we can't mm. because of the false alarm feelings that we get. Absolutely. Um Okay, so misconception free is uh, allowing a thought to be there will make it come true. Yeah, this is kind of like what I just talked about in regard to the light example. Like, mm. look at the light for one minute and make it move with your mind. People can't do that. So thought action fusion is essentially like when you think a thought is as bad as an action or having a thought is going to lead to an action. That is really pervasive in, uh, in OCD. And what was I going to say about thought action fusion? Oh, so when we're fused with thoughts, we view them as threats and we view them as actions or like calls for us to carry out an action. 
And thoughts are not actions at all. They are just thoughts. Mm -hmm. They are also not threats. So you can have a thought that tells you to do something or an image where you see yourself doing something. And that is quite simply just an image. And it's the product of having a brain. So a thought is separate than an action. And a lot of the work with OCD is like essentially differentiating between the two and working on diffusing from the thoughts. And it's tough because we live in a society where like manifestation is really big. And if you just think about it enough, it will come true. But I think, um, I, I think that's bullshit. I think like we can work towards things and I think that can help us like get what we want if we've clarified what we want. But I don't think that thinking about something enough is going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, if the thing is going to happen, it's going to happen anyways. Thinking about it is not going to change that. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so misconception four, which is I don't like the thoughts slash feelings and I do not want them to be there. I'm not accepting their presence. Ugh. Yeah. So this has to do with um, like choice and the false kind of concept of choice with OCD, where we think we have like we have a choice over whether or not we are going to let these thoughts be here. And we don't. The thoughts pop in and they are going to be there regardless of if you like the thoughts or not. And thought suppression doesn't work. So the more that we try to push down our thoughts or not think about them, the more we're actually going to think about them. So we don't have a choice. And that leads us to the thought is going to be there. You can either struggle with it and try to push it away, which leads to more distress, or you can accept its presence and let it come and go on its own, which it will. So you don't have to like your thoughts and feelings to let them be there. You can accept their presence, still find them uncomfortable, but tolerate that discomfort. And I think with OCD, because the thoughts and images and feelings are so disturbing a lot of the time, naturally, of course, as human beings, we don't like pain and we want pleasure. So we want to get rid of the thoughts. But the reality is that we just don't have that choice. Mm -hmm. Having a brain means having thoughts and feelings and uncomfortable ones a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, very true. Um mm -hmm. Okay, so the final one, misconception five, is these are bad thoughts and I'm a bad person for letting them be there. Oh, this has to do with shame. And this always, this saddens me because I think there's so much shame that comes with having OCD. And there, it's like this pervasive feeling of feeling like you are bad. And I know I felt that way for so long. I felt like I was disgusting, gross, bad. I felt like I wasn't like deserving of being around children or... Um, animals even when I would have intrusive thoughts about my dog and a lot of the shame that comes with actually I'm gonna say all of the shame that comes with having OCD is irrational because shame says I am a bad person and having thoughts does not make you a bad person it makes you human mm. and then there's the piece of thoughts being good or bad which I know when I was deep in my struggle I thought that there were good thoughts and bad thoughts but there are not there are just thoughts so that's part of the diffusion process is learning that thoughts are not good or bad. They don't have intrinsic value. They are just thoughts. And when we can see them as thoughts, we start to realize like, I am not a bad person. I am a human being. And then guilt kind of says, I have done something wrong. And guilt can be really healthy if we've actually done something wrong and we want to learn from it and like work on it in the future. Yeah. But with OCD, we've done nothing wrong by having thoughts it's not our choice and it's just a part of being human. So that shame and that guilt that a lot of sufferers feel is really, really irrational because we don't have control over what we're thinking with OCD. It's like the last thing you would ever want to think. And the reality is that every single human being has intrusive thoughts, whether you have OCD or not, they just stick for people with OCD. Mm. And because of the way that their brain is wired, they um, they stick around essentially. So we all have these thoughts. It doesn't make someone good or bad. The thing that we have control over is our actions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, a actions are kind of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I never get caught up on when people 
use bad language or say mean things as long as if it's i judge people almost i try not to judge but when i do but it's on <laughs> it's on people who, who, who am i kidding it's on <laughs> it's on people's actions you know oh, yeah. it's it's they can say what they want but if they're doing wonderful things i i say say what they want within reason there are caveats oh, yeah um, but yeah it's very much we need as a society to look on actions more than anything um, yeah including ourselves right especially from an ocd treatment point of view is oh my goodness of course um i guess yeah. from, from an act point of view and i know you're interested mm-hmm. in this uh the um uh, the committed action part and the values piece is where that, that. that action comes in. It's like, I can't control what I'm thinking. I can control mm-hmm. what I do. Yeah. And that's another thing I wanted to add with POCD is I get asked so frequently, like I have OCD really bad. I don't want to have kids because I don't want to have thoughts about my baby. Mm-hmm. And that just breaks my heart because if people want to be moms or they want to be dads, like go after that, if that is what you value, And I hate, of course it happens because OCD is so loud. And I was at that point where I didn't think I was going to have kids, but these are just thoughts. And I do not want people to let OCD dictate what they do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Move towards your values, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And that includes having kids. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that one. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So on your website, um, I think it was in your bio or about page, uh, one of the senses uh, relief and recovery are real with a large dose of evidence-based treatment and an equally large dose of willingness. So Mm -hmm. um, evidence-based treatment being obviously CBT and ERP uh, act, um, Uh but the willingness bit. So what does willingness look like? Willingness looks like the, like essentially how willing are you to be uncomfortable in the treatment process, Mm -hmm. which is so difficult. And it sounds so much easier than it is when you actually carry out the exposures. But the sad thing is like your therapist cannot do the work for you. They can't do the exposures for you. So you've got to be willing to be uncomfortable and to sit with that anxiety that comes with a doing the exposure and then B not performing the compulsion. And it's really tough. You know, sometimes I like when I have a little bit of an OCD spike, I have like it it reminds me of how bad it used to be. And I think my empathy grows a little bit because willingness is really hard when you're in the throes of it. But the reality is like to get better, you have to do the work. You've got to work on acceptance. You've got to work on exposure and response prevention or sadly, like we're not really going to get anywhere in the treatment. And it's, it's, I think it's, I hate to use the word unfair, but the disorder is so hard to deal with itself. And then you get into treatment and it's like, now you have to face your worst fears. Like it's hell. But when you do, it is beyond worth it. Like you can get your life back. You can get your brain back and treatment really does work if you are willing to put in the work and obviously can afford it. Cause I know that's a struggle for a lot of people. Yeah. No, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, let's go into your advocacy now. Um, mm-hmm. so you got a really good following on Instagram. Thank uh, you. No worries. I know it takes, takes work and time to develop that. It's like a full-time job to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, I'm, I'm always, uh, inspired by people like yourself that, that do it. Cause I'm just like, I don't know, terrifies me. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, just tell us about your advocacy, whether that's on Instagram or wherever else. So I love advocacy because I think like there, there aren't enough people talking about OCD and the ways that it can manifest. And I think even right now in this time of the coronavirus, we see so many misconceptions that continue to, um, that continue to live about OCD. Like, you know, OCD is all about hand washing when of course hand washing is a compulsion for some people, but OCD really like the content of obsessions varies so widely. And there were a couple of advocates um, when I was really struggling, like Rose, I don't know if it's Cartwright or Brecher, but I think I've seen both. She is a true queen to me. Um, I was reading her book, Pure, and I was so afraid of like anyone finding out. I would like read it under my covers at my parents' house, like at night, like my heart was pounding. And her advocacy work changed the game for me because she was 
somebody that was like younger. She was like around my age and she had dealt with the sexual obsessions. And I thought it was so important to have a figure like that come out and say like, this can happen to anyone. Like it's OCD. It doesn't mean anything about who you are. So I decided that advocacy would be something that I would get into because I really hope that people can find my page or anything else that I've done and A, either understand what it is that's going on in their mind or B, just feel like they're not alone Mm -hmm. because they're not. And I hope that, you know, especially like I really like to advocate for the more like taboo themes because I think some people won't go there, but like I go there in my posts. Like I talk about like, what if I orgasm while I have a thought come up or like I go there because that's just what happens when you live with OCD. But not a lot of people are willing to talk about it because it could be uncomfortable for them. For me, it's like my life. So why not? <laughs> yeah. No, well, thank you for being open with, with it. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great to hear. Uh, it was it was Rose uh, Br- Bratecha. I can never say uh, her surname, but it's Cart- she goes by Cartwright now. Okay. Um, I think Cartwright was her original name and Bretage, oh. sorry, was her, like, let's call her stage name or her advocacy name. Um, it's an advocacy name. This I know. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I guess just, just words of wisdom for anyone that wants to become an advocate or do advocacy work. Um, mm-hmm. What would you have liked to have known when you started? I think start when you are ready. I think sometimes there's pressure to share parts of your story that you're just not comfortable with yet. So if you want to be an advocate, start where, like, start when you're ready. And then also, like, pinpoint what, I'm trying to think of the right word for this, like, kind of like what angle of advocacy you want to follow. And it's hard, I think, sometimes on Instagram, because I feel like as much as I don't like to admit this, like sometimes it feels like a competition Mm -hmm. and sometimes you get people say really mean things or just like really obnoxious things. And it like it bothers me sometimes because it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm putting so much work into this. And then I get like I don't usually get this, but sometimes I will get like a DM or a comment that really frustrates me. So I would say like stay in your own lane and remember why you're doing this. Yes, like it's nice to have followers because you're spreading a message, but even if one person sees what you have to say and they align with it, then like my job is done. So I would say like focus on what makes you you. Um, In that same regard, I feel like sometimes it's hard as a therapist because I want to advocate for other things like LGBTQ rights and um, like racism and white fragility. And I feel like it's hard because I know as a therapist, you're supposed to have like a blank slate and, you know, clients are not supposed to know that much about you. But for me, I just decided like advocacy is a big part of who I am. And that means advocating for people with OCD, but also advocating for other things that I really believe in like human rights. So if that's what you want to do, then do it because like when you believe in your message, people are going to get it. And if they don't, then they're just probably not the people for you. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, there's a, a couple of bits I'll add to that. Uh, one is, yeah, like I think with any kind of, anytime you put yourself out there, whether it's advocacy or you just want a, a YouTube channel about gaming, um, well, yeah. tell her it's not my thing cause I'm struggling to give examples, <laughs> but whatever it is, you're always going to get pe- the odd people that are just unnecessarily mean <laughs> and yeah. have no, it yeah, hurts you. it and does. It's like, why is this hurting me? Well, exactly. Um, and yeah, I definitely get that from time to time. And it, it makes you question, why do I even do this? <laughs> uh, yeah. But then you remember, actually, 99.5% of the time, it's all good. And they're meaningful mm-hmm. responses. And, and even when it's criticism, that's okay, as long as it's like, oh, yeah. well reasoned. But it's, yeah, you, you've just got to be wary of the people that and ultimately, I look at that they're people that probably need intensive therapy and a hug um, because yeah. who in their right mind kind of speaks like that or acts like that. Um, so I You're guess, right. yeah, I just wanted to validate that for you and for anyone else listening that I'm going to say don't take it to heart, but it's easier said than done because I still do. Um, it's so hard. Yeah. And it, yeah. I, sorry, oh, we're going to no, say. No, no, go for it. 
The last thing I was going to add is I also think on social media, there's like a pressure to speak to everyone in like the perfect way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that stresses me out too, because I'll get comments like, but you didn't talk about this theme Mm -hmm. or you didn't say this specific thought. So sometimes I feel really stressed to make everybody happy, but that's just not possible because everybody's at a different point in their journey. So like, of course people are suffering and they want to hear the right thing, but you just can't like, you just can't appeal to everybody on social media. You do your best, but you can't, it's not going to like a hundred percent fit for every single person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, how to word this, like whether it's my podcast or any posts you create, sometimes the posts that kind of alienate people, and I don't mean alienate them in a bad way, but like they just can't relate to it or they get nothing out of it, are sometimes the best posts because it, or podcasts because it means you're appealing to say 10% of your audience that no other message is hitting them in the right mm-hmm. way. And if it means occasionally 90% of your audience don't get it, that means it's meaningful for those 10 Yes, Um, exactly. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to say to you, actually, is, uh, and I guess any trainee therapist or therapist that worry about self-disclosure, we talked about uh, Irvin Yolam earlier (laughs) in in his book, Gifts of the Gift of Therapy. He talks about self-disclosure and how he was so far the other end of... uh, of like he shares kind of everything in his books yeah yeah he he said if someone brings it up in session i use that as stuff to work with Mm we'll unpack why they've brought that up what you mean you know and i love that i love that too yeah um okay so uh next question is just words of hope for people with ocd words of hope it definitely gets so much better as cliche as that sounds. Um, I, like I said earlier, I thought my life was over. I thought like I was never going to have the life I wanted. And now I have like a life that I honestly never could have imagined. So do the work, um, find an OCD specialist if you can, I cannot stress how important that is and find a community of people that you feel like you can talk to and relate to because that really helps. Um, If you, I don't know, I feel like there's so much I could say. It just gets so much better. I know that it's like the most cliche thing to say, but with the right treatment and the right support system, like I said, I feel like I am 95% better. Of course, I still get intrusive thoughts. Of course, I still have intrusive feelings, but it is like night and day compared to where I used to be. So do the work, have the willingness, and it will get better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so you can pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self. Oh. What, what would you tell her? Oh, God. That was like OCD Allegra. That was when I was, like, dying. I would tell her that it is going to get so much better. Oh, my God. I feel like this is going to make me cry. Um, yeah, I would tell her that, like, your life is nothing like what it is right now. And hold on, be patient, and just know that, you're going to feel a lot better and things are going to get a lot better and you are going to make something out of this struggle that you just can't see right now. And I think also I would tell her that she has OCD because I don't think I knew at that point. So <laughs> yeah. I would tell her that, hi, you have OCD. <laughs> Go get yeah. out. Give her a head start. Um, <laughs> cool. No, thank you. Uh, and then uh, you've got a billboard. Um, are you in LA? Oh, yes, yeah. I am. Cool. So you, plenty of billboards in LA. Uh, what mm-hmm. do you want written on that billboard? Ooh, it would either be OCD is not an adjective or it would be something like, are you having intrusive sexual thoughts? There's a name for that. It would be something like OCD taboo related. Nice. It's really sad that that's what would be on a billboard. <laughs> OCD is like my life. So. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, and then lastly, is there anything else that you wish you could have said today? Anything else I wish I could have said? Hmm. I guess my last piece of advice is like, even if it's really, really scary, do your best to find a therapist and explain what it is that's going on because like you will get better more quickly by doing that. And obviously find a therapist that you can trust. But if you are seeing an OCD specialist, trust that they have either probably, if they have OCD, they've probably thought it themselves or they've heard it. So I think early on in my journey in therapy, I gave the thoughts so much power by not saying them out loud and 
really resisting in my own treatment. But once I started to, it took so much power away from them. So if you find a therapist that you trust, do your best to just dive in immediately because it makes your like treatment journey speed up a lot. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah, it mm-hmm. kind of works on some of that shame as well, right? Of Yeah, it does. Um, it takes the power. I think Brene Brown has a really awesome quote, something about like shame can't survive when we tell our stories. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, well, look, thank you so much for, for being so open and sharing your story. This was fun. Thank you so much to Allegra for her time and, of course, to you guys for listening. And don't forget, today's episode is sponsored by NoCD. To find out more about NoCD and their therapy plans, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or visit the link in the description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.